And we're live. Hey, Bible Geeks. Ryan Schumacher here. Uh, I'm here with one that's a bit off cycle. Uh, I'm not currently doing a Bible Geeks class at church right now, but uh, I am preaching tomorrow. I've been given the topic from the New City Catechism, uh, Why Did Christ the Redeemer Have to Die? And, you know, as I went through, I put a lot of work into this. I've been practicing it, and I was like, I would like to make it available for the Bible Geeks, too. I think there's stuff that you would enjoy in here. So here's the preview for my sermon. Uh, ready? We're going to get into it. So the question for today is, why was it necessary for Christ the Redeemer to die? And, you know, in some sense, this is, we don't really think about this question that much. At least I don't think so. Uh, it's sort of taken as a given, especially if you're in, you know, evangelical Protestant Christianity in the United States. Of course, Jesus had to die. Like, that's the religion. Jesus had to die. And, you know, when you really stop to think about it, though, I, I guess I remember a time when I was shocked thinking about this question. And the shock came from listening to a dialogue between a Christian and a Muslim. And you may know this already. The Muslim shared that the Quran actually denies that Jesus was crucified. It says in Surah 4, 157, and they're saying, Indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But so it was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption, but they didn't kill him for certain. And this struck me as odd. I was like, even the most skeptical of scholars, well, I guess not the most skeptical, there's mythicists out there, but most skeptical scholars, better way to put it, um, believe that you know, a man named Yeshua bin Yosef was uh, killed by the Romans through crucifixion sometime in Bronze Age Palestine. So the I <clears throat> I didn't quite understand why this had to be uh, so starkly stated in the Quran. And as the Christian and the Muslim kept talking, it started to come out a little bit that there was not just this historical point, but there were theological points behind it. So when the Christian talked about how it was necessary for Jesus to die for our sins, the Muslim responded, why must Jesus die? Why can't God just forgive? That's what Allah does in Islam. And, uh, and he responded further, like, are you more moral than God? Because the last time you forgave somebody, I'm pretty sure you didn't demand a sacrifice. Um, you know, why, why does God need blood sacrifice to forgive? And it's a good question. Uh, it's one that, you know, stuck with me for a long time, for many years before I found an answer that felt somewhat satisfactory. And furthermore, he said, I don't get, like, when you Christians say that Jesus was the Messiah, but he was crucified, it doesn't make any sense because the idea of a crucified Messiah is a contradiction, according to the Muslims. It's like a married bachelor or a square circle. Those are the analogies the Muslim interlocutor used. Um, the Messiah was supposed to be victorious over the powers, not be defeated by them. So if, you know, the... If the powers defeated him, if Rome defeated the Messiah in this case, then he couldn't be the Messiah. If he was crucified, he couldn't be the Messiah. If he was the Messiah, he couldn't be crucified. And so, you know, we we have our understanding of what the crucifixion was. Something, though, that I think is important for us to realize is that at the foot of the cross on Good Friday, the followers of Jesus were probably thinking much more like the way the Muslims spoke, than the way that we think. Nobody there who was watching the crucifixion was thinking, oh, this is all right. Actually, it's what was supposed to happen. He's dying there for our sins so that we can finally go to heaven. This is not the scene that's being depicted here. They were in agony. They, like, just, just days ago, Jesus is coming in on a donkey they're all shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Son of David, save us. They're waving the palm branches. The palm branches are the symbol of Israel. It's like a 4th of July parade. You're waving the American flag around. And he's going up the hill. And they're like, this is it. We have seen the revolutions before. They all failed. They all were crucified. But this man is different. God is with him. He is a mighty prophet. We have seen the miracles that he's done. He can make food come out of nowhere. We don't need supplies. He's been able to heal people. We won't need medics. We'll be able to keep fighting. There's no way this can lose. And he went to the temple instead of to the Roman palace. 
and started to lose followers. And not a few days later, he's betrayed into their hands. And then he's hanging underneath a cross that says King of the Jews. The Romans got this one too. And so it's a, it's a feeling of complete defeat on the part of Jesus' followers. And you see this come out in our text for today, which is the road to Emmaus from uh, Luke 24. So this is taking place after Jesus is crucified and after his resurrection. And so it says here, now some on that day, uh, now on that day, same day, excuse me, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, two of Jesus' followers, about seven miles from Jerusalem, talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that doesn't know the things that have taken place in these days? This is a big event. And he, that's Jesus, asked them what things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and leaders hand him over to be condemned to death and to crucify him. But we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. So this is a, this mindset that I just spoke of was indeed the mindset that they were in. They were hoping, you know, here was this prophet, he's with, God is with him, but he was condemned to death and he was crucified. But we hoped he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. So presumably, since he was crucified, he couldn't redeem Israel. So that that's what their point of view was. They did not expect a crucified Messiah. And then he Jesus says to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. And if he just live streamed that thing, it would have saved acres of trees and thousands of hours of theologians' time. But alas, we're, we're stuck here. But Jesus is making the claim here that what happened to him even though people expected otherwise, they expected that he wouldn't be crucified. He didn't have to die to be victorious. Jesus is claiming that not only did he have to, but the scriptures said that this is what must take place. Paul even picks this up. 1 Corinthians 15, For I handed unto you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So once again, we have a reference to the scriptures. <clears throat> now, when we as Christians think about Jesus dying and being raised according to the scriptures, we have our theological shortcuts, things that we're used to. Uh, for instance, you know, one of the things that comes up probably to many people's minds, especially if you're trying to think about evangelism, is uh, the book of Romans. You know, you've probably heard of the Romans Road, so chapter 1. The Gentiles sin. Chapter two is the Jews sin. Chapter three, well, we all sin, and we fell short of the glory of God. But, well, I should say, and the wages of sin is death. But we've been justified by faith, and the gift of God is eternal life, and there's no condemnation in those uh, who are in the Messiah, and so nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans eight twenty eight. We close the book of Romans. We don't read nine to sixteen because it's all that Israel stuff. But, but like this understanding is commonly what we associate with the death of Jesus according to the scriptures. And that's true. These are scriptures. This is, you know, the death of Jesus is very important to this story. The issue here, though, is that when Jesus was talking about this <clears throat> on the road to Emmaus, uh, Romans hadn't been written yet. First Corinthians hadn't been written yet. That would be decades before those writings would be written. And even then, you know, Paul wasn't thinking, I am writing the Bible right now. It would take two centuries before they would be codified into the document we call the New Testament and be regarded as scriptures. For them, according to the scriptures, meant according to Israel's story. And so the question I want to put is, how would the Jews have understood what according to the scriptures means? I want us to be able to look and see something or see things that maybe we didn't see before by getting into their culture and into their mindset so that when these words were used by Jesus, when these words were used by Paul, we have an understanding of why it was that Jesus had to die from their point of view. 
And I do want to just stop for a second and say, this is more than just a few proof texts. This is not just the, uh, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Thank you, Handel. Uh, this is the whole story of Israel. I mean, that story I just told has nothing to do with Jesus' death. So I want to go through the story of Israel and to get to the point at which we understand what they were thinking, where were they in that story, and how Jesus' death then fits in. So we're going to begin with the story of creation. Humans were made to be God's co-workers in the garden. Genesis 1.26, we're given two commands, be fruitful and multiply, and rule and subdue. We are to reflect worship to God, and then we're expected to reflect it into creation through stewardship. Just like, say, the, um, as an example, naming. You know, God named, called the light day, and he called the darkness night. He gave them names. Chapter 2, we see Adam is naming the animals. It's a divine function. But most importantly, they are with their God, living with their God. God is walking with them, and they are his people, and he is their God. This sort of Edenic way of living is the ideal and, you know, if you remember uh, Revelation chapter 21, the very end of the Bible where it says, look, God is dwelling with humanity. That's where it started. That's where it's all going. And the story of Israel involves God's presence descending and then a separation and then a joining and then a separation and then a joining again and then a separation until the final joining once more at the end of all things. So the first separation is the fall, human sin. And human sin results in the consequence of sin, namely separation from the tree of life, and therefore they're subject to death, and they're separated from God. So they receive the wages of their sin, separation from the tree of life, that death then finally enters the scene. But they are driven away from the garden. <clears throat> they are no longer walking with their God, and they are no longer his people, at least directly. And we go through the Noah story, we go through the Babel story, and by the time you get to Abraham, you realize how God intends to bring this back. He tells Abraham, I'm going to give you land, descendants, and in you all the families of earth shall be blessed. That Edenic blessing is promised to Abraham. It's a promise by God. God must keep his promise. And so this is one of the markers of what's ultimately going to happen. And you have Abraham's seed, Abraham's children, Isaac and Jacob and his brothers, they go to Egypt to escape the famine. And then you have another big marker in Israeli history, the slavery in Egypt. They're subjugated by Pharaoh. They're ruled over by this dark power. And God eventually sends a prophet Moses to bring them out of Egypt and ultimately culminated in the Passover. They're to sacrifice the lamb, put the blood on the doors and the jams. And so when God's judgment comes that night, they are passed over. And then through a mighty act, God reaches out his hand and saves them through the Red Sea, swallows up Pharaoh, and liberates his people. And then he brings them to Mount Sinai. And he engages in a covenant with Israel. And this is vitally important to understanding why, what the Jewish mindset was at the time. <clears throat> God says, I am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Now, if you will hear my words and obey my command, I will make you my treasured possession in my royal priesthood. The priests are the ones who are intermediaries between God and the creation, just like in Eden. And they enter into a covenant with God to be those people. God gives them instructions for the tabernacle with the ark and the mercy seat, the cover on the ark of the covenant. And that cover right there is where ultimately, when it is finally built, the Shekinah glory of the Lord dwells with them. The cloud descends upon the tabernacle, the cloud by day, the fire by night, right there on the mercy seat where atonement was made. And some scholars call it you know, God's throne, others his footstool, whatever. It's where he was. He was finally dwelling with them. That's the point. Eden had in a way been restored because God has his people who he is working through to bring blessing to the world, just like in Eden. And of course, naturally, as humans do, when they engage in covenants with God, they engage in idolatry too. So it was not too long afterwards, uh, it was actually before the tabernacle, where they you know, melted down their gold and made a calf. And just as a side note, if anybody says, 
I would believe if I just saw a miracle, please. The golden calf story is as good as it gets. They literally were brought out of Egypt through a miracle, and that same God spoke to them, and they entered into a covenant, and it didn't even take them 10 chapters to make an idol and start worshiping it. This disobedience now starts to mark the story of Israel, the wandering through the desert in order for the unbelieving generation to die out, <clears throat> the time of the judges. They're in continually disobedient cycles. They eventually want a king. God reluctantly gives them a king. They get half a good king in Saul. They get a pretty good king in David. They get half a good king in Solomon. And then it's mostly bad. And they ultimately end up engaging in further idolatry, further idol worship, to the point where they actually want to bring the idols of the other gods into the temple to worship them alongside Yahweh. And eventually enough was enough. And as Ezekiel says, the glory of the Lord left the temple, and it went to the east. And then the Babylonians came, sacked the city. No more king, no more temple, no more God dwelling with his people. The Shekinah glory had left, and they are ruled over once again by foreigners. <clears throat> they are back to the exodus, uh, or the, the slavery in Egypt. They are back to the fall. They are no longer with their God. And this is going to be a vitally important point. Now, God starts talking to them about how this is going to be restored because God still made that promise to Abraham that he was going to bless the nations through him. God still made a promise to David that his son would sit on the throne forever. God must keep these promises. So how is he going to keep them? Well, we start to see that the end of the exile is going to be the result of forgiveness which is not the same as the slavery in Egypt. That wasn't about sin and forgiveness, but the exile is. Jeremiah says, I'm going to bring it recovery and healing. That's Jerusalem. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of prosperity and security. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sins against me, and I will forgive all the sin and their rebellion against me. So here we see the recovery and healing and restoration of Jerusalem tied in with the forgiveness of sin. We see this in Daniel 2. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people in your holy city. <clears throat> Excuse me. To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. So the holy city, the holy place, the temple, is bound up. The restoration of that is bound up in the forgiveness of sins. God must forgive their sins. They must get forgiven in order for this relationship to be restored again. And if you want to know about the 70 weeks, well, we're just going to have to wait for another Bible Geeks episode. Eventually, they're freed. Cyrus comes and freed them, frees them. They return to Jerusalem. They rebuild the city. They rebuild the wall. They rebuild the temple, and they wait. And some of you know what's missing here. The Shekinah glory never comes back. What they had in Eden, what they had in the tabernacle, what they had in the temple, they thought, we have been brought back out, we have been forgiven, we have rebuilt the temple, it is time for our God to come and dwell with us again, and for us to reclaim our priestly vocation. But it didn't happen. And in very quick order, they were back under foreign rule. They were still separated from their God. They were still ruled by foreigners. It's a covenant curse. In a sense, they were still in exile just now in Jerusalem, the relationship with God had not been restored. The forgiveness had yet to happen. And at the time of Jesus, they were still waiting for this forgiveness of sins so that they could be liberated from the oppression, in this case, the Romans, and they could be restored to their relationship with their God where God came back to the temple and they could be the priests again. When they said, we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel, that... <coughs> my friends, is what they expected. That was the point of the whole past 10 minutes of me telling that story. Yes, I timed it. Uh, when they were talking about the redemption of Israel, this is the redemption of Israel that they're hoping for. Forgiveness for them would mean Yahweh returns to the temple. Forgiveness for them would mean, very practically, Romans go home. The pharaoh of this age, Caesar, would be driven out. Romanus and Domus for you um, uh, Life of Brian fans, Monty Python. 
Jesus responds to them saying, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Notice that <clears throat> he's not saying how foolish you are thinking that this would redeem Israel. He's not in disagreeing with the ends. He's disagreeing with the means because they said he was crucified, but we hoped. And he's saying, wasn't the crucifixion necessary to accomplish these things? So the question is, what did Jesus mean? How is Jesus talking about the accomplishment of these ends through different means? Well, I think the Apostle Paul summarizes this pretty well in Colossians, and so I'm going to put that up, and then we'll go through the Old Testament text. But the Apostle Paul writes in chapter 2, When you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive and together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. There's your forgiveness. And he disarmed the rules, rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, this is one that we're maybe a little less familiar with, at least in Protestant Christianity. We're a little less familiar with the idea of the overthrow of the powers. But again, forgiveness was going to be one of the things they expected. And then God would dwell with them. And driving the Romans out was the other thing they expected. Jesus is talking about driving out a different power, though, as we shall see. Let's first talk about forgiveness. Atonement, uh, atonement basically meaning uh, reconciliation for sins. So in the Old Testament, in the Jewish milieu, this took place at the tabernacle in the temple. Leviticus 16 describes the Day of Atonement. This is when the sins of the Israelites were dealt with. All of the unknown sins of the Israelites were dealt with. Um, it was done at the tabernacle or in the temple, like this 3D rendering of the temple here. Two goats were brought during this ritual. There were many sacrifices. The priest had to make sacrifices for himself to purify himself. But as it pertained to the people, there were two goats. And they cast lots. And one of the goats the, the, that the lot fell on was the sacrifice. And the other was the scapegoat. Now, the blood of the sacrificial goat was used to, as the book says, cleanse the tabernacle and hallow it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. The sin of the Israelites had defiled the tabernacle. As the high priest comes in as the representative of the Israelites, it is now defiled by the sin of the people and the blood becomes a purifying agent, cleaning the area, cleaning them of their uh, transgression and its effects on the tabernacle. It's purification. The other, the scapegoat, had the sins of the people confessed on it. It is then driven into the wilderness. It's like a toxic waste dump. It's, uh, it's a dump truck. Uh, it is sent away as far as the east is from the west. So west so far are the transgressions separated from the people. As it says, Then Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all of their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and sending it away into the wilderness by means of someone designated for the task. So the, the goat with the sins is separated from the people. And now the sins are driven away and the temple is cleansed and they're back to right relationship with God. So there's two goats. One, the sinner, is set free. The other, unblemished, is sacrificed instead. And folks, it's really hard not to listen to that and not think of Jesus and Barabbas. Barabbas, the sinner, goes free because Jesus ends up taking on the punishment. Jesus is sacrificed instead. Isaiah 53, this idea of Jesus as our substitute, who bears the consequences that would have fallen on us, is you know throughout, in particular, Isaiah 53, but it's a very prominent New Testament idea. Um, Isaiah 53, I, couldn't, I could probably do the whole sermon on Isaiah 53, but... Here, Isaiah 53, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That means we thought that God was doing this <clears throat> to him. Uh, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. It is our sin that held him there until it was accomplished. 
His dying breath has brought us life. We know that it is finished. His blood is fit to purify us so that even though our sins are as scarlet, they are wiped white as snow. So this idea of Jesus as our substitute is very prominent in this idea of atonement. Now, there's one question I really wanted to make sure I answered, um, at least to, this, to the best effect that I could, which is, why blood sacrifice? This feels a little, a uh, little pagan. Um, it definitely feels a little not 21st century. So I wanted to get into this a little bit. Why was there blood involved? Now, Leviticus 17 gives us a little bit of an understanding. Leviticus 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you for making atonement for your lives in the altar. For as life, it is the blood that makes atonement. So life and blood and atonement somehow go together. It is the giving, the giving of blood is the same as the giving of life. As life, that is the blood that makes atonement. So in another way to think about it is as life, it is the life that makes atonement. They're, um, they're equalized there. Now, one thing we can say, it's given, not demanded. This isn't a petulant, angry God who is uh, just needs to hit someone he's so pissed off. Uh, this is a gift to us to make atonement. And the best that I could see, and I read my fair share of articles that said, we don't know why. It's just the way that God says it works this way, and so we believe God. The best thing that I could find on this, though, and I'm admitting it's not entirely clear, the best explanation I could find is that God allowed the Israelites to offer the blood of an animal to symbolize offering their life back to God after sin defiled their status. So again, it is the blood, the blood that is the life, and it is the blood that makes atonement. So it's the life that makes atonement. So it is sort of the sacrifice of life. And we think about being told to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. There is something about the solemnness of the giving of a life of a substitute saying, I dedicate my life back to you. After I have gone off the way, this sacrifice represents the giving of my life back to God and the seriousness of that commitment and the seriousness of the deviation. There's something covenantal about it too. Remember the covenants, there was the animal sacrifice, let what has happened to the animals happen to us if we break the covenant. Well, you have that once more here in the idea of the animal substituting. So, and I believe that's so that we can learn from this. We can become, as God's priests, God doesn't want us to kill ourselves when we sin. God wants us, though, to understand the seriousness of the dedication of our lives to him and his mission and his glory. Now, this had to happen every single year. The blood of animals was never enough to cover all the people's sins. It was an imperfect sacrifice. It was repeated annually. Jesus, though, offers his blood for us to obtain a perfect atonement that could not have been accomplished with an animal sacrifice. Jesus' death was a voluntary offering of his life for ours on our behalf for the cleansing forgiveness of the sins that would have otherwise brought us death. So his perfect atonement is what makes this the last time this ever has to happen. Oops, sorry. It says this in Hebrews 9, when Christ came as the high priest for the good things that have to come, uh, then through the greater perfect tent, he entered once for all into the holy place. Once for all, it's over. Not with the blood of goats and calves, because they can't do it, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Uh, sorry. And then Romans 3.23, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. So there we go. The blood is a sacrifice of atonement, just like the goat was in the Holy of Holies. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over the sins previously committed. We are wiped clean. A brief moment for philosophy, if he will indulge me. Why is it important that Jesus is fully God and fully human? Kim talked about this a few weeks ago. As a fully divine being, his being is infinite. And therefore, his blood, as the blood of an infinite being, can cover all sins for all people across all time because of that infinite nature, unlike these imperfect sacrifices of old. 
And this is why the writer to the Hebrews can say, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So that's the idea of atonement and forgiveness. And I would say that if Jesus had chosen Yom Kippur, the day of atonement for his passion and crucifixion, we could stop there. That's the story. And we do oftentimes stop there. But there's more because he chose Passover. Something else is going on in God's choice for the passion to take place on Passover now that we have to pay attention to. There is a new Passover going on, a new deliverance, a new exodus that's being symbolized through Jesus' death. And we can see this through the scriptures as well. Now, in Jesus' day, they saw themselves as under essentially a new Pharaoh, Caesar. They were praying that their God would once again deliver them. Romans, go home. We talked about this. They're still in exile. Their sins have not been forgiven. And that's why God has not returned to them, even though he did in Jesus, and they did not recognize him. And so the cloud was not back in the temple, and the foreigners were still ruling over them. Something had to change this. The question was, is Jesus the one? Can he pull it off? He was riding on a donkey. That's how we expected the Messiah. He's clearly God is with him. He is, you know, he's everything that we expected. This time it seemed different. But instead, like we said, of throwing out the Romans, he went to the temple and he cleansed the temple. Quite interesting. That's what the priest did. And then he went on to have the Passover meal and described the new Passover that was to come. We're going to fly by this a bit, but remember, we have the words of institution. Take and eat it. This is my body. Odd. Why are you eating his body? Drink from this. This is the blood of the covenant. This is the bl- my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. So you have the blood being shed. You have the eating of the meal. In Exodus, uh, during Passover, in Exodus 12, it describes that at Passover, the lamb's blood was sacrificed to save the people. And then the meat was consumed. It's, uh, this is my body. Jesus is identifying himself with the Passover meal, with the lamb whose blood was there <clears throat> and whose meat was eaten. Jesus is uh, therefore talking about how the blood of the Passover lamb that saves people from judgment is his blood. And then the judgment of God that is coming frees the people from the bondage and power of Pharaoh. So it is now time after this meal for Jesus to go confront the Pharaoh. The the blood of the lamb, the blood of the covenant is established. And he is to confront the Pharaoh of this world, not just the Romans, but the dark powers of sin and evil themselves that are underlying the events of the passion. Because let's face it, Sin and evil here did their worst to Jesus. He had the injustice of the trial before the Sanhedrin. He had Pilate, who also unjustly judged him, his treachery, his power hunger. You have the cowardice of Peter, who wouldn't stay up, stand up for Jesus or to claim to be his follower. You have the betrayal of Judas. You have the shame and humiliation and the violence of the scourging and ultimately his murder and death. When we say that it was sin... You know, Jesus died for sins. There is, yes, this larger theological sense in which we talk about it, but also look at this scene. It was literal sins by literal humans that put Jesus on the cross. And any one of these people could have broken that chain of sin if they had believed who Jesus said he was and had decided that they were going to stand up and live for him instead of to serve these idols. Whether it was their power, whether it was their safety, whether it was their... Um, their aggrandizement of some form. But instead, in service to these dark powers, in service to these idols, the sin came through. The sin put Jesus on the cross. The sin executed Jesus, ultimately culminating in the worst that could be done, which is to kill him. But this, as they might say, was the trap laid for the devil. Because what happened? We know what happened. That cross lost its power on the day when that tomb was open. When death was swallowed up in victory. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O grave, is thy victory? Because Jesus showed that these powers ain't the only game in town. And in fact, after they exhausted themselves on him, he overcame them. And that their power is not a real power, 
or that rather perhaps that his power is greater. He achieved the victory over death. The, the analogy that comes to mind is Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. The, I don't have much time to tell the story, but if you know it, um, the, this is where, if you've heard the term rope-a-dope, where George Foreman for six rounds is just wailing away on Ali, and all Ali is doing is just defending. He has taken all the blows over and over and over, and eventually he starts to notice his opponent is exhausted. And then as soon as his opponent's stamina starts to fade, he punches back. And Foreman had nothing left to defend himself after Ali started punching back. This is what Jesus did to sin and death on the cross. It all fell upon him. And then he showed that my way overcomes these powers. Is it, perhaps the best illustration of this I know is from Oscar Wilde's Salome. Those of you in Bible Geeks, you've heard this before from me. Maybe you've even done it from the pulpit. This is a dialogue between Herod and a Nazarene about the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. And Herod asks, what is this miracle of the daughter of Jairus? And the Nazarene says, the daughter of Jairus is dead. This man raised her from the dead. Herod, how? He raises people from the dead? And the first Nazarene says, yea, sire, he raiseth the dead. And look at Herod's panicked reaction. The panicked reaction of the authorities and the powers and the principalities. I do not wish him to do that. I forbid him to do that. I suffer no man to raise the dead. This man must be found and told that I forbid him to raise the dead. Because when death is defeated and the sting is gone and the victory of the grave is gone, these dark idolatrous powers have nothing left. And Jesus defeated, as that part in Colossians says, triumphed over the rulers, showing them to be foolish. Jesus had to die, folks, to defeat death itself. His death was our atoning sacrifice, cleansing us of our sin that would have led to our death. Yes, we're familiar with that story. His death also demonstrated that the way of Jesus, not the way of Pilate or Caesar, Pharaoh, Satan, the powers, whatever this is, is oops, the way to truly live our vocation. He defeated their last weapon, death. And in his death, we are given eternal life. And if you're doubting me on this, I want to just a couple quick examples. Christianity conquered Rome, but it did not conquer Rome with swords. It did it with sacrificial love and martyrdom. And the emperor Constantine himself was baptized in the name of Jesus. That is how Rome fell to Christianity. And in our own country, civil rights marchers invoking the images of the Exodus committed to Jesus' nonviolent, though civilly disobedient message to the powers. They were not going to serve the powers. They were going to stand against them, but they were going to do it Jesus' way, and it brought down the evils in our country. There is the victory by following Jesus over the dark powers. And that is our calling, to use the weapons that Christ has given us, not the weapons of this world. We proclaim the gospel, we pray, and we love sacrificially. We need to, as you know, Paul Washer says, I love this quote, he says, we must put down Saul's armor, and we must pick up the smooth stones of the gospel. Because that is how you take out Goliath. That is how Jesus took out Goliath. So we are to carry the banner of Christ, declaring the defeat of death through the forgiveness of sins. And we can say, thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, folks. Well, that's it. That's my sermon for tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments, please put them down below. Um, and I will be back with a new season of Bible Geeks at some point in the future. All right. God bless.